All right. Ciao. All right. So this presentation last year was 90 minutes. I'm doing it this year in 45 minutes, and we have to stop exactly at quarter past. We just lost three minutes, so I'm going to talk really fast, and then you can just watch it on YouTube and play it at half speed later, and it'll be fine. <laughs> um, <laughs> so for those of you who don't know, my name is Mallory Cooper. Um, I'm a science fiction author, and I'm also um, an ad coach. I've built a lot of websites in the past and done a lot of marketing. Um, just to give you some highlights, like I was part of the team. Actually, it's a funny story. I worked for a company, and we built Mitt Romney's campaign website, Obama's campaign website. We ran part of Fox News and part of Al Jazeera. So we, did, we, were, we were sluts. We would do anything, you know? Um, <laughs> and, then, and, then, and then Obama won the election, and I had two weeks to build his website because I'm a Canadian, and I didn't have access to the system once it went live. So I've got to do a lot of really fun things and work with a lot of really big companies and do a lot of marketing, I mean, product building, integrating with marketing teams and whatnot, and that really helped a lot when it came time to be an author and realize I had to do everything. Um, and so that's why I'm here to talk to you guys about, talking about how to find the right fans and how to keep them. Craig lets me do this every year. He hasn't changed the name of this presentation since like he picked it in 2017 or 2018 or something, so I guess he likes it. But I feel like I'm kind of cheating because like this is just marketing. Like how to find fans and keep them is like all of marketing. So I can kind of talk about whatever I want, it's fun. Um, so I'll kind of skip over what makes me an expert. I've done things, I've written a whole bunch of books, I've written 127 books or something like that now, um, and collectively made about $2.5 million since 2016 in sales. So um, I always feel like it's important to, is it bona fides or bona fides? I thought it was bona fides, but I saw some, bona fides? Okay, I saw someone say bona fides on television the other day. I'm like, have I been saying this wrong all my life? <laughs> But I always feel like it's important to give that because I really want you to understand that like, I'm teaching stuff that I know and stuff that I've proven and that has allowed myself and my wife Jill and our daughter to basically just live the life that we've always wanted to live um, thanks to actually selling books. And on top of that, I've really focused a lot, and especially in the last two years, on helping other authors um, achieve these goals as well. Like I, I love going to conventions. I have authors that walk up to me and say, like, I'm a full-time author now because I took your Facebook courses and learned how to do it, do, do, do it or I learn how to rewrite blur blurbs properly and stuff like that. So that's really, really what I'm here for, is helping you guys. Um, and actually, you guys probably know this because Craig always says, but he makes us pay to come here and talk. Like, that's how much we want to share stuff with you. We actually don't get a free ride or anything. Um, and we have to buy our tickets beforehand, too. Like, we have to buy them early. It's like, he's just like, he's bilking us. Anyway, <laughs> no one re report that back to Craig. He'll kill me. All right, so I always say this in a lot of my presentations. I always, in a lot, I say this a lot. Um, humans buy your books, not algorithms. People focus a lot on like gaming the system, find what the algorithm's gonna do, like, find that magic sauce and all that. And at the end of the day though, what you're doing is you're putting your a human, do I cutting out or is it just me? I'll try and I'll, I'll talk closer maybe, that'll help. I'm probably, you know, I'm probably gripping the microphone too hard. Uh, <laughs> that's what she said. Um, <laughs> but. See, look, it's, it's all about engaging with, with your audience. And for you, that means your reader. You're trying to engage with your reader. You're trying to make a personal connection with them. And you're trying to make them care about you and this fictional human being that you've made up, or human beings. Usually, there's more than one person in your book. But so even though we care a lot about trying to get the algorithm to show our content by trying to run ads, by trying to do different things, at the end of the day, don't forget that the whole goal here is that you want to put your book in front of a, a human being, have them fall in love with your characters, with your story, and then buy your books. So this brings me to my next point. You are selling a feeling. That's a really important thing to know, is that you're not trying to sell plot, you're not trying to sell setting, you're not trying to sell uh, a fancy latex, ca um, I was gonna say cat suit, because I usually wear cat suits, but I'm wearing a dress. I, actually, everybody's all shocked, because almost every year I'm wearing cat suits, and this year I didn't bring a single one, so um, it's, it's, I'm breaking my brand. I'm rebranding, is what I'm doing. Anyway, um, but yeah, you really are selling a feeling, and despite what you think, um, you make basically all of your purchasing decisions based on feelings. I used to work in corporate America, and we would do studies on, on how decisions are made in corporations, and the higher you go in the corporation, the more emotional the decisions are made, actually. Um, sorry, guys, you actually make decisions more emotionally than women do by a long shot, actually. <laughs> It's statistically proven. It's actually it's interesting, funny, funny, this is another funny side note. It's determined that the stock market would be 15 to 30% less volatile if fewer men were involved in, in it. <laughs> they, they basically be, and especially young men, they kind of overestimate themselves. Sorry, guys. Anyway, I, I can say this because I've operated on both sides of the fence. I know what it's like. <laughs> I've made all the mistakes for both genders. It's amazing. <laughs> all right. 
So yes, people make purchase decisions based on their feelings. In fact, 95% of um, decisions are made, purchase decisions are made based on emotional uh, feelings. It's, you can actually check it out, this book by Jared Zaltman. Uh, it's written like 2003, but it's a really great book to understand how customers think and how decision-making processes are made when you're purchasing. But at the end of the day, really what I'm coming down, what I want you to really take away from this is every time you're selling things, every time you're putting your book in front of someone, your blurb in front of someone, you are selling a feeling, you're selling an emotional connection. That's what you want to make with your readers. Whether it's fiction or non-fiction, that's what you're going for. And you, you do that initially by conveying genre and tropes or the, the subject matter of your book via your cover. When people, um, when people are like scrolling through, actually, does my next slide have this information on it? Ha, I think it does. Look at that. I always do this. I always talk against my slides. Like you can look at this video right here and you can immediately see, it's supposed to be a video. It's supposed to play at some point here. Please play. No, okay, well, it's not going to be a video. Never mind. We're just, gonna, we're just gonna roll with that. Anyway, you can look at this and you can immediately tell the genre and what the content, what these books are about based on their cover. And I don't know why this thing refuses to play, but one of the things that's interesting is when I read science fiction novels, I need to actually look at this because it's way too small on my screen here. Um, I like reading far future science fiction. So for me to, to read what I wanna read, is, oh, I'm missing a slide, that's why. So this is actually what I love to read. I, if I see a cover that's got like spaceships and pew pew, and it's gonna tell me that this is like, this is, this is big picture science fiction. I like to read stuff about far future where humanity has expanded and explored and gone out um, into the world, into the universe, and, and I wanna see these big stories, like Star Wars stories, but with better science. Um, and I'll look at covers. I'm, the cover's gonna tell me if I have this. Like if I see covers where it's like, I can see New York City in the backdrop and I can tell they're on Earth or maybe they're on the moon and Earth is in the background. I'm like, I don't wanna read in your future. And I get that information immediately from the cover. And your cover is what is gonna share all that information with your readers. If you think about if you're writing romance, for example, and you've got a, a dude who's like not wearing a shirt and he's got a lot of tats, um, that could be a lot of different things, but you, now you take the dude and you put a motorcycle behind him, boom, this is motorcycle club romance. You take the guy and you give him um, a suit jacket and a, part, and a half undone shirt and a tie, you know, well now we might be doing billionaire mafia romance, you know. All of these clues on your cover are conveying genre and trope to people, but you're also doing it, you wanna make sure that you convey the right emotions. So ideally, in the case of this dude, like, wow, I wanna have a romantic relationship plus more with this dude, right, is what you're trying to sell. You know, with me, I wanna have a romantic relationship with these starships, apparently, or something like that. Uh, <laughs> But it's an emotion, I'm getting a feeling. Um, and for me, when I first identified it too, I was, I was thinking about like, what was my first big sci-fi feeling that I had? And it was when the Imperial Star Destroyer flew over in the first Star Wars movie, right? We we're just like, oh my God, this is amazing. Like, look at, the, look at those engines, like, <laughs> can't believe I just did that. <laughs> anyway, um, so I want you to think, to think about that, to think about the emotions. And if you, hopefully you read the genre you write in. If you don't read the genre you write in, you're, you're making this all harder for yourself. But if you read the genre you write in, then you should be able to look at a cover and say, like, does this give me the feels that I want my readers to have? And that's true for your cover and all of your marketing imagery as well. When people are doom scrolling through Facebook and they see the picture for your ad, they should get a feeling. If it's fantasy, you know, and you, and you just have like a guy standing there, possibly with or without a sword, it doesn't really tell people that much. But if you've got a silhouetted character holding a sword with a green landscape and a castle on a hill in the distance, boom, right? We've all got like, oh my God, I wanna be there. I wanna explore this fantasy world kind of thing. And that's, that's what you wanna do. You wanna convey that whole feeling. You wanna convey the mystery. And mystery is one of the biggest things you want every element of your marketing to do. You want to make it so that people say like, what's around the next corner? You know, you want to entice them. You want to say like, you know, you're doing things where they cannot see the whole image, they can see part of it. Like even if you had that image with the castle, you can only see half the castle. It creates this element of mystery, of wonder, of what's next, what, what can I find? And by doing this and making sure that your imagery, and imagery is one of the most important things in every marketing you're ever gonna do, but making sure your imagery is conveying the right genre and tropes, not only do you pull the right people in, but you exclude the people that you don't want. Um, the proper blurb and the proper um, imagery for your cover and for all of your marketing images is how you actually avoid getting one stars, assuming you've done everything else correctly. That those, that's how you're gonna filter people out who you don't wanna have read your book. So, 
I could go on about that forever. I actually have a five-day class that just talks about that particular subject. But um, again, we, I have 30 minutes left. I'm like sweating right now, literally. Actually, it's also because of the rubber dress. You, you, do, you do sweat a bunch of the rubber dress. If you came to this talk last year, you'll remember that was a key element of me talking about the fact that I was, I was sweating in my, in my dress. The funny thing, too, is when you take off latex, you actually have to do it in the shower is the best way to do it. You just get in the shower and you just sort of like just let it all wash off of you. So that's, that's what I'll be doing later because I have a costume change today. But anyway, so talking about language, there's this cool thing called priming. And before we get into this, I'm just going to ask you guys what you think that this word is. I'm just going to, you know, put that out there. It's sweat, right? Yeah. Because I primed you. I started talking about certain things and I put a word in front of you. And you could have thought, if I, was ta if I talked about candy and about how I love the candy bowls that were out there the other day and I ate like a whole lot of Snickers, um, you would have, and I talked about how there's sweets and I shouldn't be having sweets, you would have thought the word sweet when you saw this word because you can prime people to think what you want by putting the right words in front of them. It works for both words, it works for both images, and it's, it's actually called priming. It's a whole psychological thing, and you can do a lot of research on it if you'd like to as well to figure this out and, um, and learn how you can use priming to your advantage. But here's an example of an email that you could be sending out to your readers. And I can't read on my screen here. So this is, yeah, this is one about like basically being late on your next release. I mean, I've sent this email out. Like, like, I'm sorry, I did this wrong. But I've been working on a new book. I had some setbacks. Mainly, Gerald won't cooperate with where I want the story to go. It's been a bit frustrating. I'll get him in line. In the meantime, Rising Star got this really mean one-star review, and it's killing my sales. So I'm in a bit of a bad headspace. I'll keep you updated. The book is coming soon. Like, I feel like I've, I've probably sent this exact email with different names in it. Um, and this is an example of bad priming. Everything in here is negative. There's no positive angle on any of this. I'm basically I'm, I'm using the word frustrating bad headspace, um, mean one-star review, killing my sales, um, setbacks, even though like, it's not like, a, like I'm not like crying or, or moaning or anything like that, the, the email has a negative angle to it. And I'm gonna prime my readers to like, sort of feel negatively about the message I've just given them. Whereas if I can say like this one, I say I've been plugging away at the next tale of the Chosen Saga and it's really coming together. Of course, Girl won't cooperate with where I want the story to go, but when has he ever been easy to deal with? That's why we love him, right? Putting a spin on that, saying like, hey, you guys love Girl. Do you love the fact that I'm fighting with him and that he's being a dork and I can't get this dumb story to work properly? Um, I did note the other day that Rising Star got a one-star review from someone who really didn't connect with the book. So I'm just like, I'm not like saying like that's a bad thing or it's like bad or, or this person's bad. I'm just saying they didn't connect. So I respect that, but it will keep some people from joining us on the adventure. If you think the book deserves a five star um, or review rating. Why did I say that? Oh, I'd love a review or rating to help it get some, in some more readers' hands. So I'm doing an angle here where I'm talking about the same things, but I'm using priming. I'm actually using specific words in here that create positive associations with people. Um, a big one is joining. Joining is a huge positive priming word because everybody wants to join. Everybody wants to be part of something important, part of something bigger. You know, you, if you're on like a fun adventure, you want other people to join you on the adventure. Um, I, I've used the word love, which of course is a great priming word that you can put in. Coming together are positive priming words. They're, they have always have, their words that always have positive associations with them. Um, you know, getting something in more readers' hands is, is a positive way of saying, like, please buy my book, you know, and stuff like that. So this is, these are examples of priming, and, and this sort of thing you can use priming like this in your emails. Um, you can use priming like this when you're, when you're doing your blurbs, um, your, your call to action at the end of your blurb and at the end of any marketing copy where you're saying like, buy my book now, don't say buy my book now, that's negative priming. Buy and now are negative words, um, generally, is how people react to them. So you could be like, you know, join Gerald and Sarah on this amazing adventure would be a great call to action at the end of, end of your blurb or at the end of an ad. Um, you know, explore Gerald's world or something like that. Explore is a great priming word, especially for a fantasy audience or people who love hero's journey stories. It's a great thing to do. So. I'm gonna like kind of, I did, I did this wrong. I did this wrong last year as well, but let's go back to like me talking about eating Snickers. Actually, who, who um, you guys remember the Snickers ones where like you, um, the guy's Betty White and he's like just bitching about everything and he has the Snickers and he turns back into the regular person. I think of that every single time I do, I have a Snickers now, but I also think like, I kind of want to be Betty White. Like, <laughs> you know, like, is there a Snickers that can, or some sort of sweet that can turn me into Betty White on demand? I would love that. And I did this a little bit bad, but now seeing this word, you're gonna think sweet, right? because I, I primed you and I did a terrible job of it, but you know, it's, if I was slick and smooth, which I guess I am in this dress, but if I, if, I, if I had a little more time, I could totally do that. I would get it right, I swear. I was so certain I would get it right this time. I practiced that so much. <laughs> this is part of presenting, right? 
Um, so how do we use priming words? Well, I already kind of said all of this, but we're gonna like, you wanna set the stage with your images and your headlines. You're, you should be priming people with an image. The image should be telling people the genre, the trope, right as soon as they see it. And it should be excluding people both in your ads and your cover who aren't in that genre or interested in that genre or your tropes, you know, your headlines, subject lines, using positive wording, put a good spin on things. It's funny, interested by the way, good spin or spin on things is actually a negative word. I shouldn't be using that in priming because that has a negative connotation to it. Um, you also want to consider the progression of information and what sort of response you want. So this is one of the reasons why I talk a lot, when I talk a lot about advertising and I tell people don't use your blurb and don't use your cover. Um, there's a lot of reasons for not using cover, but don't even use your cover art in your, in your ads all the time. You can do it sometimes, but not all the time, because you actually want to show a progression of information, right? Like maybe your cover has like your hero on it and he looks amazing and, um, and you, it's, it's great. Like he's like, he's got like all the right muscles in the right places and he's got like this broadsword he's pulling out over his back or something like that. And that's awesome. That's a great cover, but it might not catch people who want the, 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 the green rolling hills fantasy storyline, which you have and you can now use that green fantasy rolling hill storyline with a castle in the distance, you know, or maybe a dragon flying in or something like that. You can use all of that in your ad images and then they progress and then they see the character. They saw him as a silhouette in the ad and now they see the character up close and you're doing a progression of imagery and revealing more information about your story. And you do that with both your copy and with your, um, with your imagery. And also a great thing to do too is that a lot of times your ads, when you're running ads or you're doing any particular marketing campaign, um, you might be marketing a specific trope in your story. So for example, one of my books, Out System, is about it's military science fiction, it's high tech, it has AI and metaphysics in it, and it's a big colonization and exploration story. All of those are different science fiction subgenres. And so I'm marketing to a particular subgenre, I'll really focus in in my marketing efforts, you know, my ads, um, my newsletters, I might be swaps I might be doing, if I'm swapping with a bunch of military sci-fi authors, I'll give them a different blurb that really focuses on the military angle, and then they come to my book and they see my blurb, which is a more general blurb talking about the big picture of the story. And I'm doing a progression there as well. I'm catching them with the thing that they're interested in and then I'm saying, hey, look, it's part of this bigger thing. Um, so yeah, all of the things that you can do. Also, a great priming thing, by the way, is the reviews. If you have great reviews that are gushing about your book, those are always amazing things to use in your marketing everywhere. You should be, for every one of your books, you should actually have like a list of your favorite reviews for that book, and you should be using them all over the place in your, you know, you should be having them like on your page, on your website. You should be do, using them periodically in your emails. They should be in your ads, all that sort of thing, because people, people like a recommendation from someone other than the author, quite honestly, <laughs> because, you know, they think we, that we might be um, like invested in it. So I always do this part backwards. How do we use this everywhere? This slide's in the wrong spot, I swear. Or I, I, or I just always do my presentations in the wrong order. If you've done none of my presentations, you, you know I say this all the time. <laughs> but I do really want you to be intentional with your language that you're using when you're trying to attract readers because a lot of times we, we, do, we do the language part last. Um, we write the blurb last. We're signing up for, you know, Brain of Reads or E-Reader Daily or a free book C or something like that. And they ask for a blurb and we write that part last. You know, we don't think about it in advance. We're like, oh God, that's right. I have to like write like 50 word, a 50 word blurb for my book right now or something like that. And we just sort of slap something in there and we're not thinking about the audience that's gonna see this, this blurb there or this book description. And we're just, you know, we're not thinking about how they might react to it and then how they might read this and then come and read the full blurb for our book on our Amazon. I want you to be intentional and think about who you're going to. Wow, I'm cutting out again. How do I, this happened like last year, I think, too. I was like gripping the microphone too tightly or something. Um, <laughs> oh, no, no laugh that, only one laugh that time. <laughs> Come on. I need the ego boost up here. It's a lot of, it's a lot of mental energy. <laughs> I'll be all right. Um, but um, you, you, a lot of like, so what I recommend a lot of the time when you're writing ad copy, when you're writing your blurbs and whatnot, is don't do it the day that, you're, that you have to put it up on the internet. Especially because the mechanics of you know, uploading your book, going through, making sure all the pages are, are correct, making sure the price is set, um, you know, making an ad, going through and creating all of the audience information, you know, getting the image in, just all the mechanical work of doing that puts most of us in a non-creative space. We've, we've, we've moved into more of a logical thinking part of our brain and we have deactivated the creative thinking part of our brain. So if you do all of that stuff and at the end of it you try and write this compelling ad copy or you, you try to like, if you're, if you're like me, sometimes you actually write the blurb right then. <laughs> 
because I've, who's done that? Who's written the blurb like when they published the book? All right, cool. Yeah, we're not alone. We've all done it. So I really do recommend doing that ahead of time and like being intentional and really sitting there thinking about like how am I going to create a feeling of wonder and interest and also convey tropes and genre. It's easy. It's really easy to do all of that. It's like it's a breeze. Side, side note, I'm talking about blurbs this afternoon. Um, so I'm going to jump into to actual primer words. There's a lot of different words that you can use that elicit these positive responses in people. And you really want to think about using these words as much as possible. These are some general priming, primer words. That pretty, I'm going to fall off the stage at some point, I swear. Because <laughs> it's too small and my, my, my eyes are bad. I don't know what it is. Anyway, join, union, gather, assemble, unite, rally, rally behind. I don't know why I have that one twice. I meant to take that out. Meet, um, unites in there twice too. <laughs> Just trying to pad this and make it look better, apparently. Um, but these are all words that have positive ascensions, as, as associations with joining, being part of something. And if you use these words in your marketing, people will actually um, react positively to it. And they'll feel like, oh, I get to be part of something bigger. I get to join in on something. And that's it's never bad. There's no scenario where that's a bad thing. Um, these are empowering associations that you can use. So describing your character as bold, daring, describing your story as epic, using words like conquer, you know, you know join, join John as he conquers whatever John has to conquer. Um, you know, triumph, brave, sassy. Sassy is one that people wonder about sometimes, but I think when you're writing about like a, an empowered female character, sassy can actually a lot of times be a very positive word where people want to read about this kick-ass girl. Um, sassy is not a word usually used for boys. I don't know, I'm, I kind of, now I want to write about a sassy male character. But he becomes gay in my mind instantly. <laughs> it's probably a bad stereotype that I don't want to lean into, but you know, it happens. Anyway, um, these are some words that trigger curiosity. So delve, tempting, secret, unusual. Unique is cool, but don't use unique too much because it comes across as a little bit of like a little bit too salesy when you use it. I like explore. Um, is one of the ones I use a lot. Like explore, you know, uh, you know, join Tannis as she explores, you know the far reaches of outer space or something like that. Um, if you're writing like something like psychological or horror, then of course you've got these words, bizarre, unhinged, oddball, disquieting. Um, I always try and think of like ways, how can I actually really use the word disquieting and not have it just be like really cumbersome? So there's a challenge for you. Try to use disquieting in your blurb and not have it be cumbersome. You know, I expect this to, to see this on my desk tomorrow morning. Um, and then pleasurable associations, enjoy, curl up, imagine, discover, love. Curl up is a great one. In fact, it's been used so much for romance, it's probably like overused at this point, but curl up with your next book boyfriend is like a great call to action. If you can't think of anything else, go for it. Use that one. Um, and then we have some other ones, essential, detailed, best-selling, adore, and entertained. Um, whenever I see the word entertained, though, I just imagine Russell Crowe screaming, are you not entertained, right? Like... <laughs> I kind of want, now I want to put that in a blurb. I think that'd be kind of fun. Are you not entertained? Some people will get it and some people will just think I'm insane. These are some words that you can use in general action adventure blurbs and call to action. So thrust into, deadly, headlong. Those tell you a lot, right? You think about the word like headlong, running headlong into danger. You can learn so much about a character and like how they're operating just from those words. So they're great words to use to, to convey, you know, the young character who just like, you know, gets into shit all the time when they, when they shouldn't be. Um, these are romance, shockingly, there's a lot of great words for romance that you can use to, to prime well and to bring out, you know, get people to think of certain things. Um, some of these are really specific, like they, they tie into stupid, in certain tropes, like really stupid. Like that's one where it's like the, the um, enemies to lovers or like accidental, um, you know, romance ones that they have in there. Um, captured is great, passion, desires, temptation. Did I spell temptation right? Oh, I did. It just looked like it was wrong for a second there. There's probably something that's spelled wrong in here. Thank you for not bringing it up. Um, and a couple more, some science fiction ones here. And science fiction is kind of easy because you just use a lot of sci-fi terms and, and all the nerds are just like, oh, nerdgasm, and, and they go for it. Um, some of these things too, like Fallen, um, is a great one for like if you're writing anything dystopian, just as an example. So they don't, they, they're not like universal, of course, but they are good. Do I have any more? Oh yeah, so there are some words to avoid when you're doing your marketing. Most of these are pretty obvious, to be honest, because they, they're the ones that come across as really salesy. Um, and these, but these are all words that actually have negative um, connotations in most people's minds. So if you use these words in your marketing or in your blurbs or anything like that, you're actually going to turn people away that you probably didn't want to turn away. So keep that in mind that um, that these will be avoided. But I think most of I think most authors are pretty sensitive to like salesy things because we don't come from like a real salesy mindset most of the time. In fact, most of us we have to like you know kill ourselves to try and do sales. So we're not going to run into this one too much. So. Oh, see, I did this already. 
That always happens. But what is, yeah, I guess like, you know, we, we can say this again, your call to action needs to be emotional all the time. Whenever you're doing a call to action in marketing or blurbs, it has to strike an emotional response. And then the last thing is that to really make readers stick with you once you have your readers. Um, oh my God, I'm gonna end early. I've been going so fast, it's okay. I might have time for questions. Um, which this is a little bit odd for me too because this, this presentation is really, like has, doesn't have like direct practical steps. Usually I'm like, you must do this, and this is step two, this is step three. So this is a little bit more nebulous, um, everything in here, but I do feel like um, we don't talk about the psychology of marketing and the psychology of connecting with people, but that is something that we need to do as, as authors. And you also really wanna make your readers feel like they're part of something bigger. That's always the thing that is gonna pull people into a story. That's why we read stories, right? We wanna go on that great adventure. We want to feel like we're part of, you know, this amazing thing that's happening all while sitting on our sofa with a nice, you know, cup of tea or coffee next to us. Um, or in the case of my daughter, like nine bottles of Coke. that she, <laughs> She's so addicted. I was just thinking, like, what does our sofa look like? I'm like, oh yeah, there's all these bottles of Coke over where Eva sits. Um, and I've outed myself. I'm a bad mother. But anyway, um, a really big thing, though, is to hook your readers on you. Because as you're doing all these books, you're doing all this marketing, you do want to create a brand around yourself because when they read the next book, chance, you, you, what you're trying to say is like, hey, these are all new characters, this is an all new series, but it's the same me that's there. So you really do want to think about like, how can I also make it so that in all of my books, in all of my marketing, whatnot, I shine through in some way and I'm recognizable. Um, you can do it like me. I am, I am recognizable. It's, it's like I always joke about how I probably don't even need to wear like a name tag or a lanyard at a lot of conventions. Cause it's like, look for the six foot tall blonde and rubber, you know, and that'll be Mal. But um, it, is, it is really important to actually try and figure out how to build, build a recognizable brand and how to do that through your marketing. Like how are you, how, what kind of things are you saying? What kind of imagery are you using? And are you building like a consistently recognizable brand through your marketing? Um, and that's like a really, I know we always talk about that, people talk about branding, but I always, when I talk about branding, I'm not thinking about branding my books so much as I'm thinking about branding myself and branding my stories. Um, so that's kind of where it ends. I went so fast, I'm like, I feel like I'm missing things I should be talking about. But um, we do have a much longer version of this presentation. I've, I gave this presentation first last year, um, and like I said, it was a 90 minute presentation. This was me trying to pare it down to apparently to, 40, to 30 minutes, which is unbelievable. But um, I do, we do actually teach a lot about genre and tropes. Over the last year, I've learned so, a lot about how to convey the right genre and the right tropes on your book cover and in your blurb. And then also to research what genre and tropes are currently popular and how the best selling authors are conveying these genre and trope elements on their covers and in their blurbs. And then how to bring that uh, into your cover so that when you people see your cover, they immediately know what your story is about. They know if it's gonna give them the feels or the adventure that they're looking to have. So we do teach a class on that. Um, and it's, it, that's something that uh, you can get at this link. And then we also do a lot of help with marketing and book writing. And also, um, we do help anal analyzing covers and blurbs to see if we can figure out how to help your book sell. So my wife and I do a lot of that stuff. So I do have time for questions. So the, oh, good, there actually are questions. I'm like, this is so cerebral, no one might even have them. All right. Oh, there's microphone. There's a microphone. I guess you, yeah. I was like, how are we going to do this? My last presentation, I didn't have time for any questions. So I'm like, okay, bye. We're leaving now. Okay, last time I did this, no one could hear me, so. Um, okay, this might be a stupid question, but I'm back to the whole, like, you did the, you were talking about the ads mm -hmm. and why you don't want to use your cover on your ads. Yeah. And you said that it was because um, you could put, like, the rolling fields and give that emotion, and then mm -hmm. they come to your cover, and then they see, like, the muscular guy on there. Yeah. And if the muscular guy might make other people not want to click it. Um, is the rationale for that that it's because you can run as many different ads as you want, and therefore you're not eliminating readers by using the cover itself. Yeah, so the, the reason, when I talk, when I run ads, I usually call dynamic cre uh, creative ads, where I'll put between like three and seven images on a given ad, because Facebook knows when you're running ads, um, they know that like I will click on the rolling fields, and one of you might click on the muscular guy, and another person might click on the dragon, or something like that. So they'll show different images to people based on what they're more likely to click on. So when you, if you just focus on your cover, you're only sharing that one bit of information that the cover has, but if you, if you use a lot of other variety of images, you can now capture people who 
who would be attracted by a certain image. You capture them with the image, then they read your blurb or your description on your ad or whatever you've put in there. Or your first chapter is a great thing to put in your, in your ad copy as well. And then they're hooked. They go and click, the, click the, um, the link to your book. They see the guy and they then make a second connection you know, on, on a different set of emotions or, or desires or, or tropes and genre elements. So does that, make, does that answer it? Yeah. That's okay, perfect. perfect. Thank Thanks. Hi. Uh, so you said make readers feel like they're part of something bigger. What would be an example and how would that translate for something like sci-fi romance? Well, I mean, it's, it depends, I guess, on the, on the tr kind of feeling that you're trying to, to create. Like, for my books, I, I write mostly science fiction adventure stories, so I'm trying to make people feel like they're part of this grand adventure. Um, and to be honest, sci-fi romance, I think, hits some of those same elements where people want to feel like they've t they're being taken out of their small little life on Earth and being pulled away into this larger universe, usually by forcible abduction, which is one of the most common that, tropes. That's actually mine. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but I think what you want to do is you want to make people feel like they're going on that adventure with their characters in some fashion. And you can do that like in your Facebook group. You can, you can even, some, some of the ways you can do that are kind of obvious is you can let your, your readers name characters or name plants and starships and stuff like that. And then they become, to, they become feeling invested. Um, you can also talk to them about like the, the, broader, the broader setting that you've created. You could talk to them about you know, the types of characters that they're gonna meet um, in your marketing, in your, in your newsletters and stuff like that. Um, that's like, there's some broad ways of doing it and then there's much more personal ways of doing it where you're interacting directly with your readers, you know, and you can say like, hey, um, you know, I need to, I'm, I'm gonna, here's a bunch of slogans I'm gonna put on a coffee cup or on a t-shirt or something like that and then let your readers, like, you know, um, vote on which slogan to do and then make it so they can buy that t-shirt and that makes them feel like they're part of this story and they're helping you create the story and build the adventure and stuff like okay, that. Okay, so dumbl doubling down on the, building of community. Yeah, you really, because you because to make them feel like they're part of the, the adventure, they have to feel like they're part of a community. And you have to, in a way, and this is where priming words kind, kind of come into it, you have to kind of speak to them all personally about how they're important and how they're both important to you and the story and make them feel like they're shaping the story in some way. And then that's actually how you build super fans, people that will stick around forever because they feel like, like they've been involved in building all of your stories with you. Awesome, thank you. You're welcome. Hi, this is awkward. <laughs> um, I just had a question about what, what if you like your your real self on social media is so very different from what you write. Mm -hmm. Like I always feel like I'm like alienating people by being who I really am. Like um, on my in my author brand and like in my in my little weird obsessions and hobbies. I try to implement implement it as much as I can. Like connect to my, to my books, but I feel sometimes like oh, my audience is not, that's not what they want to see from me or something like that. You know, um, I have a, actually a lot of personal experience with that. So the, the question is like, you know, a lot, a lot, none of us are exactly like, you know, our readers want us to be, like, I'm not a, a daring, you know, starship captain, as it turns out. Um, <laughs> and, and so I actually went through a very, a very visible um, transformation in front of my readers. Um, no pun intended. And um, I was really worried that when they saw the real me, they, they wouldn't want to engage with me. And on top of that, like when I write military science fiction, the majority of my readers are, are white Republican men from the southeastern United States. And I'm like, oh my God, you know, what are they going to think of me? Because um, I'm also like, I'm a fashionista. You might have noticed I love fashion, I love clothes. Um, I have like, I've, in the last three years, I've collected over 100 pairs of shoes. Like, it's, it's ridiculous. I spent one year, spent I spent $9,000 on leggings. It's terrible. Um, <laughs> And, but I am, and I'm like, but I'm like, when I, when I came out, of the, out, out as trans and as Mallory, I was tired of hiding myself. I didn't want to hide elements of myself anymore. So I'm just going to do all of the parts of Mallory. Like I have an OnlyFans, I wear cat suits. I do all sorts of weird shit all the time. And I don't hide that from my readers at all. And what I found is yes, I did lose some readers, but the readers that stuck around embraced me all the more for my authenticity. Because one of the things that people love is they want to be around someone. If you're authentic and they're seeing the real you, then they know you're honest. And people want to be around honest people because the opposite of honest people is liars. No one wants to hang out with liars. No one wants to read liars books. So the more authentic you actually are, the more they're going to feel like you're an honest person and the more they're actually going to want to engage with you. And like, like I, I also love gardening and I'll actually like to my sci-fi, my military sci-fi readers, I'll send a picture of my garden to me like, hey guys, what's your garden look like? And I'll get like all these old dudes sending me pictures of their gardens, you know? <laughs> and like, and, like I'm writing like rollicking space adventure, you know, and, and we talk about gardening and stuff like that. So I, I say go for it, be your real self. And I think that the people that, 
the, your, your real fans and the people that, that are going to like all the parts of you will engage with that, you know, and you'll, they'll stick around. What about like keeping your brand consistent? Because, uh, you know, I can be a weird day to day, you know, one picture is not going to look like the next and stuff like that. Is that, I mean, is, can that be a problem, like a social media and stuff? I think like most of us are fairly consistent in and of ourselves, right? Like, like you're not going to be posting origami one day and knitting the next day, and then oh, maybe you are, maybe you actually are that varied. And like Warhammer 50, Warhammer 40, 40k painting characters the next day, and then gardening. Like, we actually do most of us have a relatively finite set of interests and whatnot. So I do feel like that being yourself, you will actually discover you are a consistent brand all on your own, that you, you have these certain interests and they're all connected through some element of creativity and your readers will see that. You'll probably see it too. Thank so. you very much. You're welcome. That should have been part of the presentation. That was really good. <laughs> I like Hi, that question. Uh, Amy Nova, I write paranormal romance and urban fantasy and I want to talk about the sassy man thing for a minute. Okay, the sassy man, let's yeah. do this. Is there a line where you can push gendered stereotypes inside your marketing? Inside your marketing? I mean, I guess it depends on who you're trying to hit. Um, like, like say for example that I actually wanted to try and market to people who, who are cool with reading about gay men as leading characters and whatnot. So I might say like, okay, who's my audience for, that would be more accepting of, of, of gay men as reading, as leading characters. Generally speaking, it's going to be women. Women are less threatened by gay men than men are. So I might say, okay, I'm going to market this to women. And I'm going to say, well, I'm probably going to want to market this to progressive women. Um, so I might then say like, I'm going to then narrow down by people who watch like RuPaul's Drag, Drag Race. It's actually hard to market to pick certain categories now for, for a lot of queer things, but you can kind of find like, what do progressive people watch on television? And then you can actually narrow down by those kinds of things and then narrow down by do they read books? And you can kind of build an audience that way. Um, and then you can kind of do the same thing in your, in your verbiage too, I think. When you're talking, you could even say like, you know, if you, if you find yourself watching these kinds of shows on television, you know, like, um, oh, what was that one by the, that, oh, I can't remember now. It was by the people who made The Matrix. It was this amazing TV show that had these really crazy diverse characters. Sense8, thank you. Oh my God. I kept thinking Seven. I'm like, no, it's not Seven. That's The Sins show. Sense8. So, like, look for people who watch shows like Sense8, which are like really progressive, um, interesting shows with a wide variety of characters. And then you can kind of use that to find people who are going to be more accepting of diverse things. Does that, does that kind of help? Yeah, totally. totally. All right, perfect. Thank and you. that dress. <laughs> <laughs> I do love this dress. I eyed this dress for like years before I bought it. So, hey. Hi. I hope I'm not missing, uh, mixing sessions here, but, but uh, I think you said something about being able to take reviews from, um, like, getting reviews to put on your blurb and with that area. I hope I'm not missing sessions. I can't sessions. quite hear you, actually. And it's about uh, taking reviews from Amazon and using those for, set for, your, for um, reviews on your system, on, yeah. your, on your blurb. Is that okay? Can you take a, a, blur, a review that someone left you and use that? Or do they own that? Who owns that, that review? Technically, this is a bit of an interesting gray area. Technically, the person who wrote the review owns the copyright on that review. But if you're using it in an editorial sense and you credit the reviewer, um, then you can use it. Um, and, and so long as you're not defaming the person who left the review in some fashion, then you could use it. So you do have to say like the review and then you would say like, you know, their name, Amazon or something like that. Okay, or you could so say, if you put it in there as being an Amazon reviewer, then it'd be okay at that point. So, yeah. So yeah. Amazon reviewer said this. Yeah. Great. Thanks. And, and if they have their name, I think, I don't know if you have to leave their name or not. The law is probably different for each country, but something, something to show that this was an Amazon reviewer and it wasn't something you made up and you get, you're giving credit to the person who yeah. wrote it. Then it becomes an editorial thing and it's okay. To I was thinking it. in terms of putting in whatever it is that the Amazon reviewer was named. So if it's John Smith, you'd put John Smith. Yeah, you put John Smith, like comma Amazon reviewer yeah. or something like that. Okay. Yeah. Cool. All right. Look at that. With these questions, one minute to spare. We get to jet. So thank you all very much. And um, I look forward to... Thank you. There's, in a way, the I think it's at 1215, so it's an hour from now. I'm doing a talk on blurbs, and it's actually in many ways going to carry on from this talk, because I'm going to talk about how to use all the stuff in blurbs and marketing. So if you're interested, you can come to that. Thank you.